Y'all ready? We want, we, we just we streamlining, streamlining today. We just want to be able to jump into the words, to so get your Bibles out so we begin to hear what thus says the Lord. Lord, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for this day. And God, our Father, we pause. We ask your mighty power to fall down from heaven, to reside with us right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, every person who is listening, who is under the sound of my voice, you know where we are. You know what we're struggling with. You know, God, what we need to hear, what we need to experience. Meet us at our greatest void. And God, you move like only you can right now in the name of Jesus. I'm praying that you speak to us today. Unstop our ears. Allow the scales to fall from our eyes. Make our hearts fertile so that we can experience you today, right now. In the name of Jesus, we praise you. We, we bless your name. We love you and we adore you, God. So right now, I decrease that you may increase right now, God, I take a step back that you may take a step forward. Speak to us what we need to hear and what we need to receive. Our father, we say thank you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Listen, if you would go ahead and open your Bibles up to First uh, Samuel chapter or Second Samuel chapter 21. Second Samuel chapter 21. Second Samuel chapter 21. We've been talking about uh, giants. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, it's just a subject that I feel we need to be able to discuss and something that the Lord has put on my heart. And so we've talked about David and all the giants that he's been fighting throughout his ministry, throughout his life. We only talk about Goliath that happens in first Samuel chapter 17. And I've been trying to reveal to you that his life had been riddled with these giants and for us. This is applicable because we find ourselves fighting battles and battles we thought we won and things we thought we triumphed, things we thought we overcame, only to find that we're still struggling with the same thing. Because giants, although we defeat one, many times we find ourselves fighting other giants from the same hue, from the same family. And I just want to be able to talk to you um, from the subject giants. And so we talked even on last week how David in 2 Samuel chapter 21, how he fainted, how he passed out in battle. We talked about these things and it was so um, impactful in that we only talk about the victory when he's on the battlefield with Goliath and he uses one sling, he uses a sling and one rock and he defeats Goliath. But we don't talk about the fact that he's fighting Goliath's son and he passes out on the battlefield. And so I want you to be able to to walk with me as we talk about the giants. Because there's more in that text. Even in 2 Samuel chapter 21, there's more in the text. And I want to talk to you today, and I believe God has a word for you. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 18, you'll find words similar to these. It says, after this, somebody say after this. There was another battle against the Philistines at Gob. As they fought, Sibekai from Husha killed Saph, another descendant of the giants. During another battle at Gob, verse 19, Elhanan, son of Jair from Bethlehem, killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. Y'all hear this? Do y'all hear this? The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam in another battle, verse 20. It just seems like they're always, I'm always fighting. And sometimes you just get tired of fighting because I'm always in warfare. Verse 20, in another battle with the Philistines at Gath, 
they encountered, the Bible says, a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all, who was also a descendant of the giants. Verse 21, follow me. But when he defied and taunted Israel, he was killed not by David, but by Jonathan, son of David's brother, Shimei. These four Philistines, these giants who descended from the the giants of Gath, they were killed by David and his warriors. That's not the end of the story. I'm just, I want you to know that they're fighting. They've been fighting this battle here, fighting this battle here, fighting this battle here. And then ultimately when they killed the giants, keep in mind, David almost lost his life. And and because he almost lost his life, his friends, his servants told him, you can no longer go to war with us. We will handle the fighting from here. You all need to get some good friends, some people who will fight with you and for you. And so he didn't go to war anymore because he almost got killed after he was taken captive by the giants. But after all of these battles were done, And all of the giants were finally slayed. Somebody say all. After all of the giants were finally slayed. And after David had been rescued. After almost losing his life. I want you to see what happens next. In 2 Samuel chapter 22. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. Verse 1. David. Everybody with me? David sang this song to the Lord when on the day the Lord rescued him from all his enemies and from Saul. Don't miss this. After all these things happened in chapter 21. And he finally was rescued from all of his giants after his life was on the line and God rescued him. When all of his fighting was over, the Bible says on the same day, he began to sing a song to the Lord. Now he's no longer running from Saul. Now he's no longer running and fighting giants. He sings a song. But what does the song say? (laughs) Follow me. It says, he sang, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my savior. Y'all can sing that right now. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. This is David singing the same day that he was rescued. And it says, he is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. This is David singing to the Lord this song. He is my refuge, my savior, the one who saves me from violence. I called on the Lord who is my worthy, who is worthy of praise. And he saved me from my enemies. Listen, don't disconnect. I'm going somewhere. The waves of death overwhelmed me, the Bible says. Floods of destruction swept over me he says in verse six the grave wrapped its ropes around me death laid a trap for me are you are, are you all listening to the words of the song that he is singing to the lord he says the grave wrapped its ropes around me i was almost dead death all was hounding me look look at what it says in verse seven but in my distress I cried to the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry reached his ears. Listen to the lyrics of This song that David is singing to the Lord after he had been rescued from death. 
He opened, verse 10, the heavens and came down. Dark storm clouds were beneath his feet. Verse 17, he reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of the deep waters. You know, when you almost feel like you're drowning and you about to lose your feet, he says, the Lord pulled me out of the deep waters. I like verse 18. Verse 18 says, he rescued me from my powerful enemies, the ones who hated me, the ones who were too strong for me. And all of God's people said together, amen. David almost loses his life. David had been in battle after battle after battle. So much so that he's now fatigued, he's, he's tired, he's exhausted, he passes out on the battlefield. He writes Psalm chapter 56 while he's on the battlefield, while he's taken captive. He writes Psalms chapter 56 in between what's going on in his life. And we see that while he's writing the Psalms and he's singing Psalms while he's taken captive, he writes Psalms chapter 56 and God rescues him. But then he has to, there's more warfare, there's more battles. But then ultimately when it's all over with, the Bible says on the same day that God rescued him. He didn't wait. There is a sense of urgency. He writes a song and sings the song to God. What are you saying? This same uh, chapter, chapter Two or Second Samuel chapter twenty one verses one through fifty one. When you look at chapter twenty two, I mean, when you look at chapter twenty two, this entire chapter is a song that David sings to God, and he sings this after he almost lost his life. Why am I telling you this? If you look at Psalms eighteen, I'm not going to read it, but if you look at Psalms eighteen, you're going to find the same words that you find in 2 Samuel chapter 22 because Psalms 18 is the psalm that he writes on the same day that God delivered him from the hands of all of his enemies. Where are you going with this, Isaac? Just follow me for a moment. If we go to to 1 Samuel chapter 17, what does it say? What does it say? Go to go to first Samuel chapter 17, because there's something that God wants me to reveal and remind many of you today so that you do not miss this powerful revelation. Simple yet powerful. We see what happens in second Samuel chapter 22. We understand the context. He had almost lost his life. He had been in warfare after warfare, battle after battle. He's tired. He's now at the end of his ministry. End of his life. But let's go back to the very beginning of David's ministry when he fights Goliath. And let's see what happens. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. Chapter 17, verse 48. It says, when the Philistines arose, when the Philistine, that's Goliath, arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a single stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Don't miss this. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the giant with the sling and with the stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in David's hand. David ran and stood over the Philistine, took the sword out of his sheath and killed him, cut off his head. And when the Philistine saw that their champion was dead, the Bible says they ran and they fled. But that's not the power in the text. The power in the text is in the next chapter. After he defeats giant, after he defeats Goliath, what happens? In verse 6 in chapter 18, as David and Saul and all of the men were coming home from the battlefield. Look at what happens. David returned from striking the Philistines. The women came out from all throughout the city. 
singing. Everybody say singing. They came out singing and dancing and they began to sing to one another. And this is the song that they sung. Saul killed his thousands. But David, David killed his tens of thousands. They sung a song, but the song they sung, Saul killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. Don't forget to sing your song. What are you saying? Because when you look back at 2 Samuel chapter 22, you understand the context here. He's at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry. He just got through fighting all of the giants. He almost got slain. And soon as God rescues him, the Bible says that he, he sung a song to the Lord. What is fascinating to me in this text is that you juxtapose chapter 17 of 1 Samuel and chapter uh, 22 of 2 Samuel, the beginning of David's life and the end of David's life, the beginning of David's ministry and the end of David's ministry. And you, you look at the both of these and there's something that we can take away that I believe is very powerful. When you look at the text, David in chapter 22 of, of 2 Samuel, he almost loses his life and and when he's rescued, he sings a song to the Lord. But when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, you can look at chapter 17, you can look at chapter 18. Even in chapter 17, the Bible says that he took the head of Goliath, he put it in his own tent. He had, his, he had all his army, he set it up, you know, as trophies. But you look at chapter 18, and after he slays Goliath, there is not as much of a single praise that is rendered. Follow me, follow me, follow me. Just, just look, 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 at the, look at the text, look at the text. 2 Samuel chapter 22. As soon as he finishes, look at the sense of urgency. At the same day he was rescued, he begins to sing to the Lord. He, be, he, he, he writes a song to God on the same day at the same moment that God rescued him. But when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 18, after he defeats the giant, after he defeats Goliath, there is no praise. There is no song. He does not even sing a song, sing a praise. I'm not trying to cast aspersions among David, but what I want you to do, I want you to see how elusive. And how this thing works. Could it be that too many victories can cause you to become spoiled? Could it be that too many successes can create inside of you a, a sense or a spirit of entitlement? Could it be that too many answered prayers can cause you to feel like you actually deserve what you have? Look at the text. Yes, he's anointed, but it does not exempt him from creating this spirit of, I did this myself. Oh, yeah, the Lord helped me a little bit. But in the text, 1 Samuel chapter 17, he defeats the giant. He's victorious. And as he's victorious, there is no song of praise. But when he nearly loses his life, he has something that he needs to praise about. Sometimes we have to nearly lose something in order to gain perspective. At the beginning of his ministry, yeah, he has all of the strength, all of the vitality. He slays Goliath. He doesn't even break a sweat. And because he doesn't break a sweat, it's nothing to praise about, I presume. But look at his behavior. Look at his mentality. Look at how he walks about in 1 Samuel 17 and 18. But when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 22, he has a totally different attitude. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, he's at the very moment he came out of that battle. 
At the very moment that he was set free, at the very moment that the battle was completed, he was already writing a song and he was already singing it aloud. Somebody say, don't forget to sing your song. Could it be that you have to lose something? Could it be that something has to be shifted? Could it be that something must be taken away before you actually begin to praise and sing a song to the Lord? Look at the text. David is a man after God's own heart. Look, he's at the beginning of his ministry. He wins. He's victorious. Nothing. But when he nearly loses everything, I got something to praise about. What do you think? Just look at the text. There's three things that's just significant when you look at it. You look at the length of the song. You look at the authors of the song. And you look at the content of the lyrics of each song. Yes, there's a song. There's a song sung in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. But just look at the length. It's the thing that surprises me. The thing that stands out in the text is when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 22, there's 51 verses in this song. If you look at Psalms 18, the same actual song, there's 50 verses in this song. Look at the length of this song that David sung to the Lord. But if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, look at the length of it. One verse, a few words, David slayed his tens of thousands. They sung a song. Look at the length, one verse, verses 51 verses, the length of the song. But look at the authors of the song. If you look at Second Samuel, when David is writing this, David is writing this song. He's singing this song to God, God's self. He's singing to the Lord. I have something I want to sing to you about God that is between me and you. And I want to sing it right now. I'm talking to somebody. But when you look at first Samuel chapter 17, who sings? It's not David. It's somebody singing to David. You do not need another song sung to you on a worship stage. You don't need to buy another CD. You don't need to buy another song. Actually, you don't need to download another song. You do not need to purchase another song. You have a song that you need to sing yourself to the Lord. The women sung a song to David at the beginning of his ministry. But at the end of his ministry, David saw the value and the power of him singing his own song to the Lord. But just look at the contents. Look at the contents of the lyrics of the songs that were sung. Because when you look at 1 Samuel 17, they're just talking about what, 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 what David did to slay Goliath. But when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 22, David has something to say based on his experiences. The waters... The deep waters almost engulf me. The grave wrapped its cords around me. Death set a trap for me. But when I cried, he said, yes, when I cried to the Lord, he heard me in his sanctuary. My cries reached his ears. I need to talk to somebody because you have a song that you had not been singing. And right now it's time for you to begin to sing your song because it's powerful. You need to sing it, not to me. Nobody needs to sing to you. You need to sing your song. Do not forget your song. What are you saying, Isaac? Why do you have us here? This is why I have you here. David is at the end of his ministry, right? And there's so much that David learned at the end of his ministry. You know, but when you look at David, when he just got into ministry and when he just became a believer, I believe that the older David, if he could, he would have some things that he would want to share to the younger David. If there was an older David in, an, in his season of his life, if the second, second uh, Samuel 
22 David, if he could speak to the first Samuel 17, David, I believe there'll be three things that he wants to share with him that I want to share with you. Just look, don't forget your song because the devil right now in this time wants you to forget your song. He doesn't want you to sing your song. He wants you to keep your mouth closed. He does not want you to sing. But if the older David could look back at 1 Samuel 17 and 18, if he could say something to the younger David, I believe he would tell him three things. Number one, I believe the older David would tell the younger David, the real victory is in your mouth, not your slingshot. I believe the older David, and I want to help somebody today, to know that what I believe is the power behind the text is that the real victory is in your mouth, not your slingshot. The older David would look at the younger David and say, David, I have experience. I fought some battles. I've almost lost some. I've made some mistakes. And now that I look over my life, there's some things that I want to teach you. I'm talking to y'all right now. Now that I look over my life, there's some things you need to know. I don't care what anybody tells you. You need to understand this. The real victory. The real victory is in your mouth. Not your slingshot, not your skill set. The real victory is in your mouth, not your bank account. The real victory is in your mouth, not your promotion. The real victory is in your mouth and not your possessions. The real victory is in your mouth. That's why Ephesians 5, 19 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, creating a melody in your heart to the Lord. It says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to your own self, encouraging your own self in Psalms. What are Psalms, you ask? Psalms is the Bible written in musical form. Hymns are principles of the Bible translated into music. But spiritual songs, don't miss this. Spiritual songs are not hymns. Spiritual songs are not principles in the Bible. Spiritual songs are songs that nobody has heard before because these are the songs that you create out of your own heart, out of your own mouth, based on what God has done for you. Somebody here needs to know that you're waiting on somebody else to sing. You're waiting on a worship service to start, but there is a song that you need to sing based on what God has done for you and God is waiting to hear from you. Do not forget to, to sing your song. I, I'm trying to... I'm trying to help you. David would say this to the younger David, but I need to tell you the victory that you're asking God for is waiting for you to open your mouth. The victory is in your mouth, your mouth is your weapon. Sing to the Lord songs that nobody has heard. You don't need Kurt Carr. You don't need Isaac Karee. You don't need anybody else to sing a song because you have a song that's in your heart. God says to create a melody in your own heart and sing to the Lord. David would say to that younger David, hey, I need you to know that power is in your mouth, not in your skills. Somebody needs to know that. But the second thing I believe he wants to teach uh, the younger David and what I want to teach you is that you must understand that your praise must be commensurate to your breakthrough. Your praise must be commensurate to your breakthrough. Your praise must be commensurate to your Breakthrough, you know, you see that word commensurate usually when you're trying to apply for a job. 
And when you're filling out an application and they say, well, how much do you want to get paid? Well, I want to get paid based on my experiences. So I expect for you to give me as much of pay based on how much experience and what I bring to the table. So I want to make sure that they balance one another. I don't want you paying me lower than what I'm worth, lower than what I've experienced. So when you see that word commensurate to pay, commensurate to experience, your praise should be commensurate to your breakthrough. Yeah, what, what, what are you saying? That's why when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, there are 51 verses. But when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, it's just one verse. Nothing is said. No, no, no worship, no song is sung to the Lord. But at the end of his life, Based on what he has been through, he now begins to write a song, not just one verse, not just two verses, but 51 long verses. Because I have to say thank you in so many different ways, because God, you didn't just save me. God, you came down from heaven. God, you didn't just kill my enemies. You confused my enemies. You scattered my enemies. He has something to sing about. And when he sings, he takes his time. I don't, you don't need a 50 minute service. You don't need a 30 minute, you know, no, you don't, you cannot put a time on what God is due. You have a song to sing, take your time. Your praise must be commensurate to your breakthrough. Yes, I know you told the Lord, thank you for that blessing and for that breakthrough that he gave you. But your thank you needs to outweigh your breakthrough. What do you? Somebody who's listening to me right now, you remember the last time there was a time where you got a gift for somebody, right? You know, you got a gift. You took your time and you put this gift together. You, you, you wanted to surprise someone. And just imagine you coming to somebody on Christmas. It's happened to me before where I've done it and, and I wasn't as thankful. But imagine walking to somebody and you give them this gift that you spent so much money and so much time for. And then when they receive it, they say, Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. If God has done something for you, God has done something for you. Remember that last breakthrough, that last blessing that you were praying to God and crying to God for that broken heart that you wanted mended, that door that was open, that the Lord now closed. You thought you would never survive and look at you now. You're thriving. Remember that you forgot that and you stopped praising about that the last time it happened. And I'm saying to you, there's some things that God has done for you that you need to go back and press rewind and say, Lord, I forgot what you did. I need to sing about that because I want to say thank you again for what you did for me five years ago, last year, last week. On yesterday, sometimes we can win so much that it will cause us to keep our mouth closed. It'll spoil us. And, 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 and the, the, the thing about the text is that David doesn't start singing until David begins to struggle. David in his ministry doesn't start singing until he starts struggling. And it's the struggle, number three. The thing that I believe David wants to teach uh, the younger David is that sometimes you're going to need to struggle, right? Because your struggle is going to help you to sing. Sometimes you're going to learn, you're going to have to struggle because you're struggling is going to teach you how to sing. It is your struggling that's going to help to produce the greatest lyrics to the song that you need to sing. David, when you were winning, people were singing to you. But oh, when you started struggling, it put everything into perspective. And even now, God has to shift things just to get your attention because he's saying there's a song that I want to be sung to me. I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from somebody else concerning you because get this. Nobody can sing your song to God better than you can because nobody knows you better than you. Yeah, those women, those people in the city, they could sing to David and they can sing aloud, but it's nothing like David singing on behalf of David to the Lord. 
I'm talking to somebody right now. You have a song. I don't, you might say, I can't sing like someone else. God is not concerned about the tune. He's more concerned about the lyrics and your posture. You have a song you need to sing. You're waiting on a new blessing, right? You're waiting on a new breakthrough so you can say, Lord, thank you. But your behavior, your pattern just says, thank you. And you're looking for the next breakthrough and the next blessing. But you haven't made sure that your praise is commensurate to the breakthroughs that you already experienced. Don't forget to sing your song. Let me pray with you. God, we thank you for what eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, and what our hearts have felt. We repent right now, God, because we've been sitting on songs. Songs have been shelved. We get songs in our archives that have not seen the light of day. Because we've become distracted. We've become entitled. We've become spoiled. That we have forgotten what you've already done for us. Because if we look over our lives... When we were in a situation where we almost lost our lives and we couldn't see our way through, you walked with us. This time right now in 2020, in the month of May, nothing is different. You're still God. So God, right now, we repent for our selfishness, our self-centeredness. If you do nothing else for us, you've done enough. Receive our weeping, receive our forgiveness, God. We have songs to sing to you, Lord. You opened the door for me. I listened to even my own tune to my own song. Almost three years ago, Lord, I was in the ICU, God. And I had an encounter where I thought I was going to lose my life. But Lord, you saw me through. I thank you even right now for what you did three years ago. This month. So Lord right now. Receive us. Receive our hearts. Receive our lives. We have songs to sing to you. There is power in our praise. And could it be God. That we're still struggling with the things. That we've been struggling with. Because we've refused to sing the song. That we need to sing. And if we can just open our mouths. And sing the songs that we need to sing. Some of our giants will be slayed. Just by the power. Power of our song. Help us to sing. Help us to create a tune, a melody in our hearts. We don't need any more life experience, God. You've done enough for us. We can sing right now. So, God, we say thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wherever you are, if you've never had an encounter with Jesus Christ, we want to open and extend that invitation to you. You don't need a church building. We can offer that to you right now. If you don't know Jesus and the pardon of your sins, you simply repeat after me, God, I believe that you are the one true God. And I believe that you have one son who is Jesus Christ. I believe. That you sent Jesus Christ here down to earth. And I believe that Jesus lived for us. I believe that Jesus died for us. And I believe that Jesus hung, bled, died, and was resurrected on the third day. And I believe that Jesus is coming again to receive us into himself. God, I am a sinner. And I need you to save me. If you have never been saved before, you can simply communicate those words. Your journey doesn't stop there. It begins there. If you don't have a church home, you need an online community. 
We're here for you. This is where you can find us. Click the comment card. And let us know what you need from us. If you need a church home, if you need salvation, whatever you need, let us know. We will respond to the comments, the comment card, and we will engage you. We love you and we thank you. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Looking forward to seeing you next week should the Lord tarry. May God be with you.